This is Canada Reads American Style, featuring two friends who love Canada Reads and Canadian literature. Welcome our host Rebecca from Michigan and Tara from Ontario. Hi everyone, it's Rebecca, and today I am chatting with Wilson Connie Bear, who is a proud Canadian American who has written movies, television, theater, and radio plays. Most recently, he wrote and directed the feature film American Hangman, which premiered on Netflix. Of interest to Canadians of a certain age, he is the son of Rod Connie Bear, who played Jerome and Rusty on the beloved CBC children's show, The Friendly Giant. But today we will be discussing his amazing first novel, A Feast of Wolves, which is set in the U.S. and goes after the whole country and imagines a modern French Revolution complete with guillotine on the steps of the Capitol. Welcome, Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, thanks. Listen, I have to just let everybody know that the book is about 500 pages, and I read (laughs) 450 pages in two days. And I am a slow reader, but I could not put this book down. I think for anyone who loves uh, intrigue and political intrigue and machinations, you will absolutely love this book. Uh, But I want to start out because there are probably some people who will listen to this who have yet to read the book. So can you please tell us a little bit about it? There are probably two or three people who Uh, haven't read the book. (laughs) And for their for their sake, I'll, I'll just try and explain. Well, A Feast of Wolves is a novel built around a question, which is, as you pointed out, what if there were a French Revolution in modern day America? And the image in my head was a sort of hands-on takeover, complete with a guillotine on the steps of the U.S. Capitol, beheadings, an attempt at a new constitution, and a group of truly irate citizens who managed to take over at least half the government, creating a kind of split state. Most of the novel takes place in Washington, D.C., where you have half the city controlled by one group and the other half controlled by the other group, and the good guys call themselves the government of record, And the bad guys, those are the ones with the guillotine, Rebecca, call Mm -hmm. themselves the changers. And into this, I introduce a hero who has been appointed to a board of what are called reasoners. Now, there are 12 reasoners and they represent in theory. And I thought this was very funny when I came up with it. The last 12 reasonable people in America. They're the ones chosen to mediate this disaster and knit the country back together. But of course, as you suggest, nothing goes the way it's supposed to go. And before we know it, uh, we're not sure who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. I have to laugh because when I originally, I think it's still on my post when I read the book, I said something about my only, dis- I don't I don't even think I said disappointment, but I said my only complaint was that there weren't, I think, certain people who got their heads lopped off. To be honest with you, there were a few. I kind of wanted to see some more CEOs and things like that, you know. But anyway, and I think I horrified some of my friends. So I was like, oh, well. Well, maybe they thought you were talking about specific people. I, I, I'm i very proud to say yeah. that there the word Trump is nowhere in the book. Yeah. Nowhere is the phrase red state, blue state. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is fiction in that sense. And then so a lot of our favorite people who we who we love to hate in Congress um, have been fictionalized. Yeah. And I will say, I wasn't even necessarily thinking of specific names when I wanted more heads lopped off. Honestly, <laughs> I was thinking more of the type of people, like some of these CEOs who have made like, you know, a thousand times more than the, their lowest paid employees, people like that. That's who I kind of wanted to see on the on well, the steps. You, you actually hit a good point there because there's a, there's a, there's a flaw in the book or, or there's a departure from the day, what we're living today and the book, which is, in the book, the insurrection caused by the changers is not about personalities. It's not about mm-hmm. you You are a bad guy and I am a good guy. It's really about grievances. And most of the grievances I agree with. So you have mm-hmm. senior citizens who are on Wall Street furious about their pensions have become worthless because some CEO got you know, sank the bank, but still, still got his forty million dollar bonus. Yeah. There's um, the, my my favorite moment, which is the two nuns who light the health insurance company on fire. Yeah, <laughs> um, because they're they're nurses in a local hospital. There are um, 
I, I, I'm not denying some of this was fun to write. I got to say. Oh yeah. And of course the banks take a beating in this book. Yeah. They really do take a bit of a beating. So most of the causes, I have to be honest, I think it's chapter three where I really went into it. And that's the first part I wrote funnily enough. Oh, um, that's where I really went to town. And then looking around today, I go, the problem is they're not really specific causes. It's just people furious because so-and-so isn't getting elected or do you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's more cult of personality than it is issues. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with that. I a hundred percent agree with that. Now I do want to know though, um, because there is something about this book that we haven't mentioned yet, which we'll talk about in a second here, but I want to ask that I think is the most fascinating thing about you having written this book, which is um, what prompted you to write the novel and when did you start working on it? And then after that, I will ask you about the publishing process because that whole, I'm sure this whole story is going to be very, very fascinating, fascinating to our listeners. Well, this is, first of all, this is the book I wrote because this is the book I wanted to read. Um, but the funny thing is my motivation wasn't to, to write some huge tract about schisms in American society, which sounds pretty boring even to me. What I wanted to do was just write a big, muscular, engrossing novel, good or bad, that pulled you in and carried you along. And I was thinking of those, um, those doorstoppers that were published in the 60s and 70s by people like Leon Uris or oh, yeah. Arthur Haley or Cornelius Ryan. So I was aiming at the person reading a waterlogged paperback at the cottage. Now, there's a Canadian reference. <laughs> but as often happens, one's very worst instincts are subverted, and mine were subverted. And I began to realize that what I wanted to do was take that structure and use it to reflect what was clearly um, a growing crisis uh, in the Western world. And this is around 2015, 2016, as things were starting to lurch to the far right and a backlash against systems and social structures, you know, that were no longer helping the, the no longer working for average people. But I'd go into Barnes and Noble or chapters and I'd look at the new fiction table or shelf and I'd say, so where are these books? I mean, where are these books that reflect what we're all living through and what's consuming our life? There were a lot of worthy books about, you know, my sad childhood in Botswana or understanding my own sexuality or the angst of teaching at a top 10 Northeastern university. But not a lot about the fact that people were using credit cards to make car payments or just how the system was letting them down yeah. after a lifetime of feeding into it. So I, I just didn't see the book I was looking for. Um, so I began to think of a book that had some actual social social significance um, and just around that time, the UK opted for Brexit to the surprise of every one mm -hmm. of the UK's leaders. The US voted for Donald Trump to the surprise of everyone in the media and the intelligentsia, except my son. And I started to put these two ideas together, uh, a system that was falling apart at the seams uh, to the surprise of people who built that and the desire for my desire for a rollicking good read. And that's how I got to Feast of Wolves. It took me two years to write the book. I finished it in 2020. And then I had this idea to preview sections of it on the web to see if there was interest and how people would respond. And that was, believe it or not, Rebecca, before the presidential election in 2010, 2020. Yeah. So I got a small but respectable readership and figured, okay, let's approach agents and publishers and see what they think. And what they thought was zero. I mean, rejection across the board, dozens and dozens of them. And the reason seemed to be, I'm not making this up, mm -hmm. that Trump, they felt had just lost the election. And they figured that the story of an insurrection in the USA was an idea that had passed its best <laughs> by date. Hmm. Now, one Canadian agent, very well established, very respected, who I will not name, said, and I quote, Wilson, you've written a history book. No, will, no one will care about Trump by Christmas. Wow. I wrote it down. That's how I know exactly what he said. Yeah. And that was 2020. So I had a book that the traditional book industry didn't seem to be tracking. And, and the next thing I knew, things changed. And they changed drastically, very quickly. Um, sorry, I have to say one other thing. The other thing I got from an agent was, again, this is now just after the election. 
Wilson, your book is a little too crazy. You've got people attacking the U.S. Capitol dressed as wild animals, <laughs> wearing antlers and wolf hats, <laughs> and you've got a Supreme Court that goes along with it, and a president who may have ordered it, and a military that can't stop these people from taking over. Wilson, it's ludicrous. Yeah. So that's kind of where I was. Okay, so talk about how you finally got it published. Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. So uh, uh, what eventually happened was uh, I kind of took it off the market for a little bit because I was very sensitive about what had happened with um, with January 6th. And a friend said to me, there's a micro publisher in Toronto uh, called Indent Publishing, and they are doing books about music and poetry and small stuff like that. And they would be thrilled to do it. And I said, okay, you know, let's talk because if you're willing to do it and we're not going to exploit January 6th and we're not going to, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to present this as a serious book, then I, I'm, I'm game, but it would never have happened at a major publishing house or that was the message I got. So I'm very indebted to them. They did a great job. And we got the book out finally um, to, to just a couple of months ago. But it really took, it's, it really is a little engine that could project. And I'm very pleased to be where we are right now. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's, a, as you said, you're not naming names in this book. And, and, mm-hmm. I, and it's interesting because I wonder how many people will pick it up or even possibly dismiss it because they think somehow it, it was written after it happened. Do you know what I mean? Rather than you had the, I don't know, foresight to, well, even like you said, you were just trying to write a really great book, a great story. And then son of a bitch, it all came true. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Exactly. Well, I, first of all, I, obviously I hope the book stands on its own, regardless of when it was written. Yeah. 10 years from now, it's not going to matter if it was, you know, uh, November of 2020 or November of 2021. But I think most people and and members of my family, and I'm specifically talking about my sister right now, <laughs> uh, say things have said things like, "I got your book, thank you for and thank the publisher for sending it, but uh, oh, I'm a little scared of it." And I understand that people are they're done in. I mean, we are wall to wall Paul. Everybody is in the political business right now, and it's wall to wall and most of us want to read just to get away. And my answer to that is, Hey, th- no matter what, this is a thriller. This oh yeah. An adventure thriller. Yeah. And it just so happens, as I said, that it also relates to the same things that are consuming the rest of, you know, that, that, that you're worried about and that you can reflect on and it reflects the times that it's written in. But first and foremost, it is a hopefully well-told tale and a strong narrative and, and it's hopefully a page turn. And that was, that's my, that's why I was very pleased by what you said up front. But yeah, I, I think it's, I, haven't we been kind of trumped to death as it were in the literary, in the fiction world, especially nonfiction? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And Actually, I can't think of any fiction where he appears. No, but I think he's just, he's just almost a fictional character to me because he's so <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> that you almost think, how could a human being actually be this person? So I kind of think of him and I have to laugh. I've never, I don't say his name. I actually, from the day he got elected, I, I had to have a name for him and I call him the dumpster and everyone who knows me when they talk to me about him, they refer to him as the dumpster as well. Cause it's just the, what that's the word I use and that's what the word they use. But you know, he's such a, and it's scary because you know, he might come back again. I don't know who who will see what happens. Oh, I, oh, oh, I think he's coming back. Oh, I know. I'm trying not to say that to make it, <laughs> to make it yeah, true. No, I, I, yeah, I, but no. I, but yeah. I do, I want to just say this though, for people who may be reluctant, like your sister to pick this book up and read it. I think it, it yes, it, it is, oddly like the way things turned out. However, as you said, it's really a rollicking wild story. And I think I read 160 pages, like in sitting down, I read like 160 pages. And again, I don't do that because I'm kind of a slow reader. I get really, I have short attention span. I get distracted by things, but I couldn't put it down once I got to, and I will say just for readers, just so you know, it did start a little slow for me, maybe about the first 50 pages. It felt a little slow, mm-hmm. but again, 
I'm easily distracted. So that could have just been, that could have just been me. But after I got to a certain point, I was like, holy crap. And I stayed up till like two in the morning, three in the morning reading it, which is not what I normally do. So I really want to encourage everyone, if you haven't read it, don't even worry. It's not a dumpster story. It's not, you know, it's just a really well told, you know, just that political thriller. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Anyway. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to keep raving about it. And get, I, no, I, really... I, I think you should, I think you should, I should be quiet and you should keep talking. So I think it should happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want people to read it. So yeah, definitely. Okay. Let me see what was, oh yeah. So then my question though, because I do have to tie it back to the January 6th thing, because when January 6th happened, where were you? What were you thinking? Did your book immediately come to mind or did you later say, oh my God, there are so many parallels? Like when did it sink in what you had done and what they had done? Well, I have to be, I have to cast you back and say, okay, so we had had Trump elected or uh, uh, Biden elected in tw- November, 2020. Um, about uh, four weeks before that, I had put the book or parts of the book out online. So it was out there. And at the time I was uh, living in Southern California or, or spending a lot of my time in Southern California where my kids were and my wife was working. And we were watching, I don't know what we were watching. I don't know why. I guess we must have watched his crazy speech on the mall. And I, I went to the, the heart. <laughs> oh, I know. We were watching to see the votes come in, right? Mm-hmm. They were voting. Yeah. And I went to the hardware store to get some hinges and I had the XM radio on. And I remember hearing Chuck Todd say, there's something going on. They have removed the vice president from the chamber. Oh. <laughs> and I, that's kind of in there. That's mm-hmm. kind of in the book. And I got home and I'm standing with my kids who are all grown up and we're standing watching the TV and when I was seeing those rioters, and especially the way they rioted and or were pushing against the cops, mm-hmm. and the and you know we the people with face paint and the crazy antler guy and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. I was shocked. I was shocked. I was horrified. You know, obviously my first instinct was more as a person mm-hmm. and not a writer. Uh, I couldn't believe this had been allowed to happen. And then as it got stranger and stranger through the day you've read the book so you know Mm -hmm. the the where are the national guard where are and this was my book unfolding yeah right in front of my eyes it was very spooky and there you know sections of the book that can be illustrated 100 percent by pictures taken on january 6th yeah and the similarities are remarkable including the takeover of the two chambers and the fecklessness of the cops and so on. Um, what I couldn't understand is how unprepared everybody was mm-hmm. for such an eventuality. I mean, apparently I was because I'd already worked it out on a piece of paper how you would do this. But I'm just a dummy writer. I figure surely the intelligent forces in the federal government should have seen this coming and acted on it. So I had very conflicted feelings. But because of January 6th, we held ba- I held back the book. Yeah. for about a year. But the book that was eventually published was the book. Uh, I didn't change it at all. I didn't add any. And it even, even has a virus in it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a very tepid virus. I think it only kills 40,000 people. Which now looks like I was, you know, shortchanging the readership. Yeah, definitely. But, um, <laughs> you know, but as I said, I think I think where the book diverges from reality in that case is that in a feast of wolves, the national uprising is over real issues. Mm -hmm. And what I, to this day, I am still not sure what January 6th was about other than a cult of personality and a call to arms for a cause that was utterly crazy. And you know, what's interesting with everything, you know, we're all talking about uh, Gen Z after the two Justins in Tennessee Yes, just did their amazing, Yeah. oh my gosh, I've, I've just, they, they make me so hopeful and Gen Z makes me so hopeful. So honestly, your book could come back around again in a different way, and well, except it's led by, like you say, it's about, you know, things that are taking place and not that cult of personality. 
Well, I won't, I won't spoil it for you or anyone else out there, but uh, believe it or not, the book actually has optimism at the end mm -hmm. yes. because I think eventually reason too is inevitable. Um, it may not be the reason we started out seeking mm -hmm. and it may not be the perfect rational world. Well, I mean, a lot of people just want to go back to some magical past that never existed anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's where we want to, no, we don't want to be. But I think that there's a, a, I think there's still room for hope despite the fact that at the moment it seems we are, we are completely off the rails. I do. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know if you read the polls in the last few days. It doesn't look good. Trump looks, Trump looks very powerful. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I think everybody's boxed themselves into this crazy situation where he's, where are we may of, of 2023 and he's the inevitable candidate. I mean, yeah. Come on folks. We got to do better than this. Yeah. And th well, that's why I'm hopeful for Gen Z because the studies I've seen or the polls they've run or something said that 70, it looks like about 70% of the Gen Z voters would vote not for the dumpster, let's put it that way. So not Republicans. So I'm hopeful that there are enough of them. And they said, I think they said it's something like, I can't remember the number of young voters that will turn 18 every year for the next four to seven years or something. And it's just give it, that's the only thing I have hope about, because I'll be honest, I haven't had any hope for such a long time that the two Justins just really lit a fire under all of us, I think. And uh, I'm just, that's the first hope I've had. So I'm oh, I could give you, I could give you hope. All you come visit us, Rebecca. We, I have four kids. The youngest is uh, 20. Uh, the eldest is 27. And they are, they're part of a, a generation and, and have been their whole lives that is relatively and very, they're relatively colorblind, but they're not colorblind. Mm -hmm. They are, they are accepting. They are very open-minded. They are if you will, a much more embracing and caring generation. And yeah. they have an eye and a suspicion about, about their civil rights that I think previous generations didn't. All, all I was doing at that time was uh, um, drinking beer and, and trying <laughs> to find the next party. Mm -hmm. And they're out there marching for people's rights. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's incredible. And just in their, in their makeup, their friends are of all different races and colors and creeds and and education and income classes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I agree, except that I felt that way when I was living in California. So as I've said this so many times, people are sick of me saying it. I lived in California for 30 years and I came back to Michigan to help with my family stuff. And when I came back to Michigan, I have to be honest to how shocked I was at young people here who were really conservative. And that shocked me because I spent 30 years in California where I was in that bubble of big cities where mm -hmm. most people are liberal and most people have some compassion and whatever. But I came back here and I, it really, I just didn't expect it. I don't know what, I don't know why I didn't expect it really, but I didn't. I agree. I agree that outside of major cities and certainly California is sort of this outlier yeah. in terms of its own liberalism. And some of that liberalism personally drives me out of my mind and, and makes me crazy. But it is spooky. I'm right now in Virginia. And when I drive to Toronto, I go through because I'm a coward and I don't want to fly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, it's not for fear of flying. It's fear of everything else. Yeah, yeah. No, treat, I, uh, same here. <laughs> being treated by United Airlines as beautifully as they choose to treat me. <laughs> it's not my idea of a good time. But you do that drive or you do... And, and, and Michigan is the same deal and you're fine. You're fine. And then suddenly you're in certain parts of the, of the state and there are these massive Trump as Rambo posters mm -hmm. and there are these massive Trump signs. I mean, the guy's not even, you know, it's, as I say, it's only 2023. It's not even the nominee and um, people have some very, very set views and more interesting. They're very, very happy to display them for you all. Yeah. Um, they're almost pugilistic in how they put up, you know, you're in Trump country now. Yep. And that's a little spooky. 
Yeah. But I don't necessarily see it. I see that. I believe those people are the parents of the Gen Zers. Yeah. I don't think the average Gen Z kid, I say kid because I'm older, is sitting around thinking about, uh, you know, how can we ban books? How can we limit people's rights? Yeah. And and how can we, um, yeah, basically those two are are indicative of the kind of crazy stuff going on in Florida. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to go back to the book because yeah. I did have, I did have another question for you, which is, was there anything you wanted to include in the story that you thought at the time might be too out there? There's stuff I included in the story <laughs> that I did include in the story that was too out there. <laughs> and I would turn to my wife, the wolf thing, the whole wolf thing, the fact that they're wolves. Yeah. Uh, just to explain the, the symbol, or it's very hard to explain. The um, there's a track in the novel. The changers are are have a manifesto, which is called Words of the Wolf, which is this anonymous person has written basically a battle cry for the uh, forgotten Americans. And this is presumably what they're using to inspire them to take over the capital, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as and and to show their solidarity, they do two things. They wear sports jerseys. And I'm talking like Green Bay Packers and, and Cowboys and stuff like that. And they wear wolf hats. And and some of them even go further and dress up as animals in general. The wolf thing, I mean, somewhere around the second or third draft, I had this idea uh, about these people wearing hats and wolf snouts to signify their allegiance to the cause. And, and it was sort of a patriotic statement for them especially as they as they gather on the mall and turn it into a sort of patriotic campground but i i would turn to 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 people i in my life and say this is too much right i mean this is absolutely <laughs> crazy no one's going to believe this i also thought that some of the idiocy of what the leaders of both causes were espousing would make no sense whatsoever everybody's just demonizing the other guy and suggesting that so and so is in a real member of the revolution. They're not really with us. And, you know, these people got, have to be uh, uh, removed. And so, and it was just, I thought, well, nobody would believe something so blatantly pandering and such an obvious con job. Uh, so I would start pulling that stuff out. Then I would watch the news and then I put it right back in. So I, but I would say the main thing was the idea of, of the attack on the Capitol with people dressed up as wolves. <laughs> <laughs> which still makes me laugh yeah yeah oh and i know the other thing was i had a tremendous amount of fun figuring out how you would take apart the u.s how the how the u.s structure would fall apart in terms of the supreme court and the 25th amendment and what if the vice president did this and then, then if the president resigns and who does this and what if the speaker i had a tremendous amount of fun figuring that out assuming well that could never happen we would never be in that situation where we're talking about. And lo and behold, obviously, the reason to uh, protect Mike Pence, other than humanitarian reasons, on the sixth was the Twenty Fifth Amendment. Yeah. By the way, that's a weird story too, right? I'm dying. If I have dinner with Mike Pence, which I hope never happens, yeah. <laughs> but if, if I have dinner with Mike Pence, I don't, and I only have so many questions. The number one question I want to ask Mike Pence is not about his beliefs or why he has to have a male friend with him when he has dinner with a female, <laughs> any female. Yeah. I want to ask him this. Why would you not get in to the limousine with your own yep. secret service guys after Jan 6 yep. on the day? The, uh, you know, once things had been declared all clear. He wouldn't do it. He went with other guys. Yeah. What did you know? Mm -hmm. And and how did you know it? And what were you protecting yourself from? And I'm telling you, since he had to just uh, testify, I'm hoping some of those questions come out. I mean, because I, I think it's so cowardly that he won't talk. He, you know, he, he, he needed to be, you know, compelled to testify. So I agree with you. It's like he knows a lot 
And I hope we find out one day. And I hope it's not one of those things that we don't find out for a hundred years. I'll be dead. I want to know now <laughs> what happened well, uh, in detail. Mike is always capturing and snatching cowardice from the jaws of bravery. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at yeah. the last second, he will always do the wrong thing. <laughs> right? No, Mike, <laughs> do you have any idea what it means to me to like you? How far I had to come to like you? And then just as I'm about to say, you know, Mike's maybe not saying, then he goes and says, no, uh, the president and I have made up and we're best oh, friends. Still. And you go, come on, man. I mean, g- give us something. Yeah. But he's in a, he's an unusual customer, but I, I truly want to know what he knows. Yeah. And I think it would be a benefit to the nation if he knew, for instance, that perhaps there were literal officials involved in this um, insurrection. See, I don't understand why he doesn't think that that should be the most important thing he presents to the American people, because if he could get some of the conspiracy stuff out of the way and people stop believing in the dumpster, and if he could really (laughs) literally tell us exactly what happened and who we should and shouldn't trust, because he knows. And the fact that he doesn't, even though he professes to be a Christian, he won't do the right thing. And and I just think, God, that guy, he has he has the keys to so much. And I just hope that he's I don't know, I hope on some level he feels compelled to tell the truth. But I don't think he'll ever tell the the truth as long as Trump is alive. Yeah. And you know, all we're one Big Mac away from all these problems going away. Yeah. So who knows? He might we might find out very, very shortly. But it, Mike's behavior does it does bring out the the crazed uh, conspiracy theorist in me, which is not my favorite side, because it's you know it's it's very mysterious. Have you ever listened to those recordings of the Secret Service guys when they've sort of got Mike hidden in the back room and they're looking out the door and saying, "There's 16 of them. We've got to get past 16 people." Oh, and yeah, I don't know that I heard that. Oh, yeah, cool. and and Mike's like sitting there in the in the in the supply closet waiting to be scurried off into the limousine or to the, to the uh, armored cars. And uh, the secret service guys sound completely unable to deal with the moment. And then they start calling home. Oh yeah. yeah, They start calling home and saying to their families, they love them. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, they did earn you guys, right? I mean, you are secret service dudes. Like you must be armed. Give it a shot. Go for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do, do your job. Okay. So to wrap up the book, because yeah. this is the question I wanted to ask. I thought about this one because, again, it's about that hope, right? But mm-hmm. do you think the U.S. needs re- reasoners now to fix what ails us? Could that work? No, I don't. I think we're past the idea of a panel of reasoners or some sort of Warren commission or nine 11 commission mm-hmm. that anyone would listen to. I mean, look at the January 6th commission who cared in the end, yeah. whose mind did it change? I think the U S in, in particular is at a turning point. I mean, 5% of the people seem to rule the country. And those are um, you and me people who, who are, have gotten an education who are probably on the right side of, of, um, you know, uh, were, were folks who vote were probably involved in, in community activities, et cetera, et cetera. There are also the same people who are hosting and talking to one another on MSNBC and CNN, as well as Fox. And they don't care much for the other 95%, as our good friend Tucker Carlson reveals to us. Yeah. Um, and the 95% for its part is realizing that it did get screwed and it, and it doesn't know who to turn to. Yeah. So people are turning on their neighbor. I think the, the, the only way out of this is education. And, and that's going to take a long time because, you know, rather than educate the citizenry on how the system works, which would take about a half hour in fifth grade, people have chosen to adopt views that they're fed on social media through Fox or whatever. We're going to have to get rid of, we're going to have to turn away from that stuff Yeah, and understand exactly you know, uh, for instance, what was Mike Pence doing? Well, he was verif- he was certifying the vote, uh, folks. And that's he can't change it because that's the law. So yeah. there's your insurrection gone. Trump can't do this. He can't just you can't just bring in 
soldiers and fire on, on American citizens, et cetera, et cetera. We need a major educational cleanse in the United States. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to keep on going where we're going. And right now, you know, we have both sides, left and right. The extreme left and the extreme right are for outlawing books. Did you ever think we'd get to that? No. You know? I really I really didn't. And I yeah, I agree. I think the extremes on both ends are just they they're just too much. And and we and we just need to stop demonizing each other. And I have very good friends and I I I'm, I'm sure you do too. And you you figure they're they're the good folks on your who share most of your views. And then suddenly they put out in support of those views the most vitriolic, violent, dangerous let's go kill the dumpster as you call them or whatever. Yeah. And you're shocked. I'm shocked and horrified. Yeah. I, I, and we, we have to turn the temperature down and educate ourselves about how the system works and what it can do and what it can't do and what our responsibilities are as people. Otherwise we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And I want to say too, this is not just an American problem. This is a Western problem. Mm-hmm. I don't think, I mean, look what's going on in the UK right now. Yep. They don't know if they're coming or going. Um, the king gets, uh, uh, is coronated and, and people are on the streets yelling and screaming about getting rid of the monarchy. Nobody seems to understand what the actual role of the monarchy is in terms of a layer of government, etc. It's just, it's just noise. Everyone's making noise on both sides. And, you haven't asked me the one question everybody asks me, which is when they find out I'm Canadian, what about the trucker strike? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I didn't understand about that at all? Why were they uh, flying Confederate flags? Well, that's like people in, in Pennsylvania, right? Good God. Why are they flying uh, Confederate yeah. flags? You drive there, you go, well, of all states of the Union. If you know your history of all states of the Union, yeah. you should not be flying Confederate flags. This is like Gettysburg, man. Yeah. This is like <laughs> you are the last guys who should be flying these flags. And the answer, the reason I'll tell you why they were flying Confederate flags, because it's just a symbol to say, screw you. It yep. has nothing to do yep. with the rebel battle flag. It has nothing to do with the Confederacy. It's just people so angry and they they can't articulate why they're angry. They can't say I know what to do. I'm going to elect a new alderman or whatever. They're, they just want to yell and scream like six-year-olds and jump up and down and hold their breath. Yeah. And that is what that Confederate flag is doing. And it, and I was on the 401 uh, just the day that it broke up. The 401 is a, the, inter, the transcontinental highway in Canada. I'm driving along. Guys are blasting past me in these F-150s with the flags and they're screaming at the top of their lungs. And you just, how did we get here? Yeah. You just wonder, how did we get here? And that's why I'm pleased to say that at the end of Feast of Wolves, always bring it back to the book, folks. Yes. Always bring it back <laughs> to the book. There is a, there is a sort of embrace of, well, we, can, we can't go back to where we were, but we may be able to go back to course correct this. And we may go back to a sort of, quasi uh new deal and and that's where we're gonna go and i'm not spoiling the ending or anything like that because i think i do actually think that the difficulty everybody's having can be solved as i say with rational minds and and thinking it through and 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 behaving with your head and not your heart but we also need to have a clear image of where we need to of where we want to go yeah and screaming around it with battle flags and trying to terrify people, which is what people are doing. Yeah. I mean, that, that flag, let's face it, certainly to 14% of the U S population yep. means one thing and one thing only. Mm -hmm. And that's horrific. Well, I thought that was a great way to wrap up the, the book. Now I do want to, I do have a quick question for you, which is just, do you have another book on the horizon? I do have another book on the horizon. I have, uh, be, okay. So, I don't know if my daughter, who is uh, in her early 20s, and, and my wife, are, have really read A Feast of Wolves. 
I think they say they have, but they're not very <laughs> happy about it. And a couple of years ago, I said to my daughter, I'm going to write a book about us as a family. And she said, this is terrible. So you got to picture us. We're in Southern California. We're driving along. I guess I'm driving. She didn't have her license yet. And she says to me, oh, I don't think you can do it. I said, no, it'll be fun. It'll be entertaining. It'll be fun. And maybe we'll like solve a mystery. We'll be a family that solves a mystery. It'll be a lighthearted book and it will be charming and so on and so forth. And she said to me, oh, I don't, I don't think you, you have the ability to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in, well, that's like waving a red flag. Forget it. <laughs> So obviously I've been working on that in the background and it started to come to the foreground. I, I really love it. It's a project um, uh, called the Rialto Beach Murders. And it is set in 1938 in the thinly disguised town of Rialto Beach. And it has no insurrections in it. There's not a guillotine to be found. There's a lot of, oh my goodness, it looks like Mr. So-and-so has been murdered. And I hope it's fun. And it's basically so that the people in my family who do not want to get another Feast of Wolves <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> and then I'm, and then the one right after that is, is to deal with, is dark and has to do with America's obsession with religion. Oh. So. Well, I, Wilson, I just have to tell you, this has just been a wonderful conversation. It's been so fascinating to me. And I want to just tell everybody, please pick up a copy of A Feast of Wolves. I promise you, you will really enjoy it. And I love that analogy or the um, the description you gave, which is it's a cottage book, like a, a what did you yeah. say, a, a, a water damage? I, I think I said it's a, it's a, it's a water. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. Where, absolutely. Where you, somebody's left the book at the cottage. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who. Nobody ever knows who. Yeah. And it's it's all puffed up from being on the dock or and it's it's a waterlogged cottage read. And those and some of the best reads of my life are from books like that. And that's really what I set out to do. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And we do look forward to uh, having you back when the uh, the next books come out. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I appreciate it. It's been wonderful being here. Thank you for joining us on our bookish journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing Canada Reads American Style wherever you listen. You can connect with the podcast and Rebecca on Instagram at Canada Reads American Style and with Tara at On a Branch Reads. Until next time, keep reading.